Today we're diving into a crucial concept in critical care medicine, fluid responsiveness. This is an essential topic for anyone working in the ICU, and it helps guide our decisions about fluid management in critically ill patients. And the best way to understand it? By exploring the Frank-Starling curve. Let's break it down. So what do we mean by fluid responsiveness? In the ICU, when a patient is hypotensive or is showing signs of poor perfusion, we often give fluids in an attempt to increase cardiac output. But not every patient benefits from more fluids. Fluid responsiveness is the idea that some patients will see an increase in cardiac output with fluids, while others won't. Our job is to figure out who will benefit. Now, to understand how fluids affect the heart, we turn to the Frank-Starling mechanism. This is the relationship between the volume of blood filling the heart, also called preload, and the amount of blood the heart pumps out, or stroke volume. As preload increases, the heart stroke volume increases, but only up to a point. In the early stages, the heart responds well to fluid boosting stroke volume. This is the fluid responsive phase. But here's the catch. At a certain point, the heart reaches its limit. It can't stretch any further, and additional fluids won't improve cardiac output. This is where the patient becomes fluid non-responsive. Giving more fluid here might not help and can even cause harm, leading to issues like pulmonary edema. So how do we apply this in the ICU? Patients in shock or those who are hypotensive may benefit from fluids if they're on the left or steep part of the Frank-Starling curve. However, if they're on the right or flat part of the curve, giving more fluids might not help. We need to assess where the patient lies on this curve. To determine where a patient is on the Frank-Starling curve, we need to measure stroke volume at two different preload levels. One common method is to give a fluid bolus and observe the percentage of stroke volume improvement. However, if the patient doesn't respond to the fluid, it can still lead to fluid overload since the bolus has already been administered. An alternative is the passive leg raise test, which temporarily mobilizes around 300 ml of blood. If this maneuver leads to a 10% increase in stroke volume or more, the patient may be fluid responsive. Another method involves evaluating the variation in intrathoracic pressure in mechanically ventilated patients where preload increases during expiration compared to inspiration. Whichever method you use, fluid responsiveness is indicated if stroke volume increases by more than 10 to 12%, provided that the patient has regular rhythm. You can also assess parameters like systolic blood pressure variation, pulse pressure variation, changes in cardiac output, or velocity time integral VTI. These measurements help predict whether increasing preload with fluids will improve stroke volume. To recap, fluid responsiveness is about finding that sweet spot on the Frank-Starling curve where an increase in the preload would predict an increase in the stroke volume. This can be assessed by looking at the stroke volume variation with respiratory movements or passive leg raising by at least 10%. Using dynamic assessments can help guide these critical decisions in the ICU. Thank you for watching.